Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff, and I want to do another episode of Ask Erica. A huge question that I get asked a lot is, why don't I review more lower-end smartphones? Well, I have been trying to do that more lately. One of them that I did review is the Moto G, and I really did like this phone. I think for the price point, and even the specs that this has, that this performs incredibly well. So I was curious and I had to check out the Moto E as well. This is a $130 smartphone, that's pretty impressive. I am seeing that in the late future, not right now, but in the future, I'm seeing that we might have $20 Android phones, but right now Motorola really does take it with the $130 smartphone. So I don't have time to do a full huge in-depth review like I did on the Moto G, but I do want to talk about this phone so I want to approach the question, is the Moto E worth it? So you all might be curious to know that for the past week, I have used this as my daily driver. I have faithfully used this as my daily driver. I did kind of a Moto E challenge to see if I could handle using hardware that's just this low spec. And my answer to that is yes. For the most part, definitely yes. The one thing that really is not so good is this five megapixel camera on the back. It's got a fixed focus lens so you cannot autofocus on anything close up. So if you want to take a snapshot of a document or something and send it, that's really not going to cut it with this particular camera on the back. But I do have some sample pictures and footage that I will show you. Here's a camera test on the Moto E, just seeing how this looks. Turn around in a circle. This is only in standard definition so you really can't expect anything nice at all, if it even exposes on my face, so we'll just have to see about that. for the low-end specs that this device has, I have been surprised to see that this device is actually quite responsive and it's incredibly usable. It's got Android 4.4.2 KitKat on it. That's something that you're just not going to find in other lower-end smartphones. And I've been happy to see that the battery life is actually pretty good. It holds up just like a lot of the other Android phones on the market that have pretty good battery life. I've been able to get five hours of screen time without any trouble whatsoever and that's just using it a lot through the day, although it doesn't have a very high specced SOC inside of it, so it's not drawing a lot of power. Also, like the Moto G, this does not have a removable battery. It has those back cases that you can customize to the color that you like. It's a little bit hard to get off. So you've got a battery that is enclosed inside of there. You can see that battery peaking underneath here. This device doesn't have the best of build quality, but it doesn't creak or anything like that. But you can definitely see that battery peaking from under there. And this is not user replaceable. I swear I'm going to take this apart and take a look at this. But you can see that it's definitely not removable and that might not be good for some. But seriously, this is $130. You have no right to complain. We've also got a micro SD card slot here, which is just so important because this device only has four gigabytes of internal storage. 2.21, I believe, which is available for you to install applications, which is just nonsense, pretty much. 2.2 gigabytes is so small that you won't be able to install some of the games that have a lot of data to download with that game. Like Asphalt 8 was one of the games that I had a lot of trouble downloading 
it would tell me that there just wasn't enough internal storage. You do have the ability to move some applications to the SD card, but that's not going to include the data files that go with large games like Need for Speed and also Asphalt 8. Things like that just are not going to be moved over to the SD card. Things that are under 50 megabytes will. So with the lack of storage, this is where people really lose interest because there is no higher grade option. It does cap at four gigabytes for everything. But I was able to figure out ways how to install Asphalt 8 and how to install Need for Speed and you really can install those bigger games. It just takes a little bit of tinkering. So if I was to pick an audience for this device, I think that it's going to be people who are new to Android, new to smartphones, if you have a kid and you just don't trust them with a device that's expensive, you can get them one of these for 130 bucks and you really just don't have to worry about it anymore. This device will also be good for nerds, people who have a little bit of money on the side to buy a device to tinker with. I think that it kind of gives the incentive to learn a little bit about Android, how to unlock the bootloader, how to flash ROMs onto it, how to root, how to do all those things so that you can fully optimize what this device is capable of. But otherwise, for general performance of the device, this device has been pretty decently snappy. I think that 4.4.2 KitKat works pretty well on it. It is a little bit laggy here and there. The place where you have the most trouble is underneath the web browsers. Things just don't load very quickly or they take some time for the page to render. It's not very fast in that way. But for the games that I got on here, this does have the Adreno 302 GPU inside of it, which I'm pleasantly surprised to see does work quite well for all the games that are still on the market. You do see some couple frame drops here and there, but I just, I can't complain. The performance still is pretty good. I have genuinely enjoyed using this for the past few days, except for really that camera. This device on the front has Gorilla Glass 3. I am very happy about that because usually on lower end smartphones, you don't get Gorilla Glass 3. So it is smudge resistant, so you can easily wipe it off with that oleophobic coating and it looks like brand new again. And also Gorilla Glass 3 is pretty good with scratches. It's the first type of Gorilla Glass that I feel pretty comfortable not having a screen protector on. If you do get scratches, they're fairly light and it has native damage resistance. So they have done some extra stuff. I don't want to get into all the scientificness about the glass, but the actual molecular formation of this glass before they go to temper it or harden the glass is better than it was before. So it doesn't get damaged so easily, which is great. But if you drop it, you, it's just like every other smartphone. It's just gonna crack pretty much the same. So it's really more for scratches. So that's just brilliant. We've also got a speaker on the front of this device, which isn't the best speaker, but I'm telling you, I'm actually fairly happy that the speaker is on the front because I'm able to watch content and it sounds pretty decent. It's not the loudest speaker, but it definitely gets the job done. And another funny thing about this device is that this display on here, I can't tell you how many displays that I have seen where the company just wants to have that display pop or they want to achieve some effect. So the grayscale calibration or the color accuracy is just really not good at all. And here we have this cheap little device that comes along and the calibration really isn't so bad. So I want to show you some measurements as well. So looking at this display, it's 940 by 560 or QHD, not Quad HD, but QHD, Quarter HD. Shockingly, this is an IPS display. It's not the best IPS display as from the side, you do lose quite a bit of brightness, but you don't have those colors shifting all over the place, which is nice. You just lose brightness from an angle. And also this device exceeds my expectations with the amount of colors that it's able to show. I was surprised because usually cheaper phones don't have a very wide range of colors and this one does. So luckily this is not considered a washed out display. However, I do see that the greens are a little bit skewed towards yellow. So the greens are kind of yellowish and the reds are a little bit orangey. A good thing though, is that I really don't see much evidence of them tweaking colors, which is a good thing because when they tweak colors, they can tend to look really off. 
My one real gripe would be that they shot for gamma 2.4 instead of 2.2, so the gamma is a little bit too high. And when the gamma is too high, not only does it saturate the image, but it also makes the image darker as well. I noticed that mostly underneath games, that sometimes content just doesn't look as lively as it should. It's a little bit dim. So the goal was to give the display some pop, but instead some content tends to look too dark. But still, in comparison to some of the other displays on the market, even flagship displays, the calibration on this is not so bad. Lastly, it's got a decent contrast ratio, and the darks of an image look pretty decent because they didn't mess up shadow calibration. So watching content is actually pretty enjoyable. So I've been enjoying this device for watching Netflix. It's smaller, it's got a pretty small footprint, so I've been able to take it around in my pocket. It does really well for phone calls as well. I think the reception actually does pretty good. So for what it is, it's actually a pretty solid purchase. So before I continue on with this video, I really wanted to take a second to thank my sponsors over at audible.com so much for making content creation possible and travel possible. If you don't know who Audible is, they are a leading online provider of downloadable audiobooks with over 150,000 titles from every genre that I can possibly think of. A title that I am checking out right now is called Orange is the New Black, My Year in a Women's Prison. This is also a Netflix series right now coming back on on the 6th. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, so I just had to check out the book that went along with the series because this is the original. The lady's name is Piper Kerman instead of Piper Chapman, and some of the character names are different, and the storyline is a bit different as well. It's interesting because some of the characters are actually a lot nicer than in the series, but I totally recommend it. You learn more about Piper as a person that you don't learn in the show. So if you want to check out this audiobook or any other audiobook, follow audible.com slash Erica to download your free copy and also try out Audible service. And if you don't like this audiobook for any reason, you can exchange it, no questions asked. And also, since they are an Amazon company, it's very easy to log in with your Amazon information. So follow audible.com slash Erica. I really do recommend this. And as a bonus at the end of this video, I actually want to dunk this device in water. This is the Moto G that I put in water before. It survived 30 minutes without any trouble whatsoever. So basically there is a water resistant nano coating, a very, very, very thin coating that adheres to everything all over the phone, including the internal components. And when liquid comes in contact with it, it's repelled off of it. Now for tap water, this worked just fine, but I did learn my lesson. I decided to get a little bit ballsy and put it inside of a bowl of soup. And I got in contact with the company P2i after my phone was damaged because this does not have the dunkable technology, basically the nano coating that is non-conductive, that keeps any type of impurity like salt water away from the internal components to where they cannot short circuit. But what's on here is just a splash resistant nano coating. So if something like soup or salt or chlorine gets in contact with weak points, such as that connectors, you're probably gonna end up with a fried device, which is exactly what happened to the touch screen on this device. It no longer works. It's something that I can repair, but uh, Poor little guy is just gonna have to be retired for now. So this one also has that nano coating inside of it. So if you splash it, if it gets water on it, if you're in the rain, it's not gonna care whatsoever. Even if it gets dropped in the water for a few seconds, it seems to be just fine. I want to try it out for a little bit longer than a few seconds to see how well it does. What was impressive about this one is that even though it was fully submerged for 30 minutes, no water got underneath the display. And I'm not exactly sure how, because when I opened it up, there's nothing keeping it watertight. So little guy, we're gonna have to see what happens to you as well, but I just, I just, I just gotta do it, you know? And then I want to take it apart at some point, but let's, uh, yeah, I shall dunk him. So like I mentioned, I put the Moto G underneath water for a half hour and absolutely nothing happened to it. No water got underneath the camera, no water got underneath the screen, everything was still working perfectly. The speaker was working perfectly. And I don't understand how water didn't get into the display or underneath the camera because this is not watertight. Water just goes right inside the device, but somehow did not reach these places. And once I took it apart, I couldn't see a reason for why water did not get into those places. So water must be repelled pretty well with that nano coating. But the build of the Moto E is quite a bit different. It's very, very minimalistic and quite cheaply built. 
So I'm curious, I want to just simply dunk it for a few seconds, a few minutes, see if it's even surviving anymore. So let's go ahead and uh, see what happens, shall we? I actually want to go ahead and turn the screen on so it doesn't turn off. Let's go ahead and adjust that to, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes. All right, you ready for this? All lame, it's not in all the way. All right, I did a quick run to the bathroom. It is now completely submerged. And that screen is still on. Looks like it's doing fine. I don't see anything under the display yet. You can see blub, 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 blub. So there is water going inside here, completely waterlogging it. It seems that it's still getting Wi-Fi reception. It seems that it's still getting also 3G reception. I just took it off the tripod so that we can continue seeing this here. Ooh, low battery. Look, it just, it looks like, you know, nothing is happening to it. This really does quite well, just in tap water. And I don't see any water getting inside that display. It looks perfectly all right to me. You can see that that display is working just fine still. It's not going to be so happy because there is water on it. Oh no, there actually is water underneath that display and you can see that right there. That's somewhere the uh, Moto G did <laughs> better on, but it looks all right. I don't see any water underneath that camera, but I'm curious though. Yeah, that camera is still working just fine. Let's see if the speakers work. Shake, 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 all over the place. On top of my Xperia Z2, which is completely waterproof to a point. Okay, I turned the volume up all the way. And I can hear that the uh, speaker is very, very, very faint. But it is indeed still working, so I'm going to have to see if I can tap this out, see if it makes a difference. But already I can see that it just is not as resilient as its bigger brother. Ha! That touchscreen just stopped working. With the Moto G, the touchscreen worked just fine with a very similar dunking to water. And uh, this guy just doesn't want to work at all. So I'm going to have to let it dry out. I'm not even going to be able to make a phone call because it's just, well, I can't even get to the dialer right now. So just completely different already than the Moto G. So I'm going to have to let it dry out. Let's see if I can tap it out for a few minutes and uh, see where we're at. So I want to be entirely honest with you all. This device just does not last like the Moto G does. Now with the Moto G, I really would not be scared to take it out in the rain at all. I would not be scared to accidentally drop it into a puddle at all. But this device, uh, even though Motorola is saying that it does have a splash guard, splash resistance, P2I nano coating, whatever, it's, look at it. It was just underneath the water for a minute, maybe, a minute and a half. It was not very long at all. The display is not even turning on anymore. So that's really all I have to say about that. Um, I don't fall for it, even the splash resistance. Maybe if you get some raindrops here and there, but definitely don't let this device get very wet. So as this device's sad epilogue, I took it apart. I really am not liking these moisture indicators. They're quite red and they are dripping red dye all over the place. So here we have the battery. You can see that it's just adhered to this back cover here, just with an adhesive. And it's got a connector, so it connects right here onto the board. The good thing is, if you happen to get a Torx screwdriver, you really can replace the battery by yourself as long as you don't cause any damage when opening this up, because it doesn't look very complicated whatsoever. So on the back here, you can see that we've got the headphone jack and the contacts are on the board right here for that. The next interesting thing that I see here is that this is actually the speaker. This is the loudspeaker and it's on the front here, but it's actually a speaker that's from the back. 
Right here is the Synaptics touchscreen controller. We have a little connector right here that this went underneath. This is actually just a piece of capped on tape. You can take that off. So this little connector was right here, and then we've got the clip. So the touchscreen controller might be fried. That might be why the touchscreen stopped working. That's the same thing that happened to the Moto G, except for that didn't happen with just plain water. Now underneath here, we have the LCD flex cable, and it's got one of these as well. Now this is something that I would have to pry upward. I don't know if I have the tool to do that. But anyway, the rest of what we have here is the micro SD card slot, micro SIM card slot. We've got the five megapixel camera. We've got the vibrating module right here. We've got our various buttons, our SOC, and we've also got our USB charging port. I used a flathead screwdriver just to release these clips so I could get to the flex cable underneath here. Go ahead and uh, pull this outward. Ho oh, ho 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 Here we go. This looks like to be the problem right here. You can actually see that it just went poof. It just isn't happy. It just went poof burn. And now it's, uh, yeah, you can see that that's just completely short circuited. <laughs> so this is where those weak points are. If you get anything touching these, you really can short circuit and uh, go fry, and that's exactly what happened here. So this is indeed damaged. So let's just go ahead and release these screws from the board. So that releases very, very easily. So you can see there really is not much to this. I simply could just replace this. I wonder how much this would cost because I'm fairly confident that the rest of it will probably be working all right. It looks like it's just the screen that went bye-bye. I could probably take these buttons out or it would probably come with the assembly of the display. So basically, I've essentially got two Motorola devices that need to have a replacement for their display. <laughs> Yay! Now I do this, these torture tests, because I love you all and I think you should know. And I'm just a very curious creature by nature and, well, this is what happens when you put the Moto E in water. Thanks for watching. So please let me know what you think about this device. I really do think it's worth it, especially for the price point. If you need a good camera, really don't go for this device. It's just a bare bones smartphone that actually is pretty good as a performer. If you need a backup device, if you need a device you can just throw into your glove compartment, if you need a device for your kids and you don't want to buy an expensive device, that is really who this is for. And of course, for all of you nerds out there, uh, I recommend playing with it. It's just really fun to get a hold of something that's really not supposed to perform so well, according to everybody, and see it excel. So thank you everybody for watching. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. I will do more Ask Erica videos. This has just been a one question based video. So please ask your questions in the comment section below. You can also ask them on Google Plus on the video link that's posted here. On the 10th, I'm going to be taking a plane ride over to France so you won't be seeing my background here anymore, but I will still be filming videos out there. I will be out there for two months because I'm going to be visiting my fiance, but I will continue making videos and that's really all I had to say right now, so please don't dismiss this little phone. I have to name it. Maybe you all can vote what I should name it. Good night.